I learned a new word recently that I'd like to share with you, and you probably haven't heard it either, which is ironic considering so many of us suffer from it on a daily basis. That word is dysthymia. Now, before you click out and head on over to Google, I'll share with you the definition. Dysthymia, in layman's terms, is high-functioning depression. Hi, I'm Linda. This is Linda's World, and this is Self-Care Sundays. And in this episode, we're exploring the concept of dysthymia, or high-functioning depression, and the seven symptoms you need to watch out for for yourselves and for your loved ones. We've all seen a depressive episode, or major depressive episode, where a person takes to their bed and stays there, quits bathing, can't summon the strength to go to work or school, their life and their livelihood suffer because of it. They may even speak of feelings of hopelessness and suicide. And we worry for these people, and we hope that they get the help that they need. But what about all of us who are waking up every morning, jumping in that shower, heading on over to work, walking the dog, changing the kitty litter, feeding dinner to the kids, watching their Netflix shows, and just rounding the bases in life, when really we're all suffering from the symptoms of depression just on a higher level than some who are clinically depressed. Well, I've got a whole lot to say about this, including the seven warning signs, so stay tuned because that list starts right now. Before we commence with the list, I'd just like to say a few words, if I may. First of all, I'd like to point out that I am very aware that I'm not a licensed psychologist. I'm just a person who has spent about three decades of her life grappling with mental illness and finally got the courage to stand up and speak out about what was wrong at the age of 28 when I was diagnosed with four major disorders. Since then, I have made it my business to do my research and find out exactly how to live with the situation that lives in my head and educate my loved ones on how to deal with me. So there. Another thing I'd like to say is that if you're just finding this video by happenstance and you're not yet a member of Linda's World, why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell as well so you can tell when all new videos drop to this channel. Linda's World is largely an inspirational channel where you can escape the real world for just a little while and return when you're ready with the tools you need to live your best life, even when you're not exactly living your best life. And now, with no further ado, Seven warning signs that you may be experiencing high functioning depression or dysthymia. Here it is. Okay, so the first experience you may be experiencing, <laughs> that didn't come out right, is a feeling of hopelessness. Okay, now all of us have felt hopeless at one time or another, especially regarding difficult situations. Our country and our world is currently facing a pretty difficult situation, and I'm sure that most people are feeling uncertain and a little bit frightened. But hopelessness is a little bit deeper. Hopelessness is a situation where you get it in your head that whatever is wrong now is going to be wrong in two years, in 20 years, in 60 years, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. No matter who attempts to alleviate your situation, you poo-poo the alleviation and tell them that it's all well and good and thanks for your support, but quite frankly, I'm just going to die miserable with this problem. Okay, Um, all attempts to seek help for your problems seem to come to no avail and they're thwarted. And with each passing day, you become more and more hopeless that the situation will never alleviate itself. And that is what hopelessness is all about. And this is a major sign of depression as well as high functioning depression or dysthymia. So there's your number one. Okay, now the second one revolves around your eating habits, okay? Now, in a major depressive episode, people may experience a situation where they have a complete lack of appetite or a huge appetite. They either eat everything in the refrigerator or eat nothing at all despite people's pleas to do so. Now, eating disorders are an entire different category that are an offshoot of depression, and they themselves are a mental illness, but that's not what I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of the fact that because of the next symptom I'm gonna get to, your eating habits kind of go awry. Um, Whatever is in front of you seems like a meal to you. A person who normally would try to sneak a vegetable or a fruit into every meal, a person who was really conscious about the gluten-free aspect of their diet if need be, or the amount of vitamins that they're intaking or calcium or what have you, whatever is for their own physical health, they sort of poo-poo that. And out comes the quarter pounder or the whopper or whatever is close it's available because you just can't summon the strength to do some of the, or practice I should say, some of the wise eating habits you've had before. After all, what's the use? If you're just gonna die alone with your problem, as indicated in the hopelessness, then why not shove a Big Mac down your throat and say the hell with it? We're all gonna die anyway. 
right? That is the kind of eating habit um, problem <laughs> that I'm talking about. Okay, now I'd like to go ahead and go to number three because number three speaks volumes about the one I just said. And that is constantly feeling fatigued and exhausted. Okay, now of course, as we age, we can't do the things that we used to do with as much vigor. There was a time when I used to sleep three hours a night, feel absolutely spectacular, and clean the entire house and go to school and hold down a full-time job. Those are the days, okay? But I was also 20 back then and I'm 43, so I totally understand that fatigue comes with territory. But that's not the fatigue I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of fatigue where you just can't, where a simple trip to Walgreens makes you need a nap. I'm talking about the tiredness where you sit on your couch and you have to pee and you think about the number of yards that separate you and your toilet bowl and you really have to make a deal with yourself to see if you really need to pee or if you can let it wait till the next time you have to stand up because you just can't get off that seat because you're just too darn tired. Yes. That's the kind of fatigue I'm talking about. It takes everything out of you to raise your hands in the shower to wash your hair. It takes everything out of you just to walk down the block to where you've parked your car. That kind of exhaustion. That kind of fatigue. I'm at a point now where I am so exhausted that sometimes I cannot speak. Literally, cannot speak. There are days when I can't get out of bed. I, raising my arms to wash my hair in the shower is too exhausting for me. I can't even do that. And of course, speaking to number two, which was the eating habits, if you're dog tired, okay, as the saying goes, how could you possibly spend your hours after work going walking around stop and shop with a metal cart, fighting all the people in the aisles and picking out nutritious food and then going home and preparing it and then sitting down to eat it and then clean up the mess when you're done in the kitchen. That's unthinkable. You're tired because you have high functioning depression. Okay. Now the next sign, because we were speaking of eating earlier and because we just spoke of tiredness is our sleeping patterns. Now there is, there are two kinds of people I'd have to say. You have your people with your insomnia and your people with your high hypersomnia. Okay. Now insomnia, we've all heard before. And of course I used to make a whole lot of jokes back when I suffered from insomnia just to alleviate my own um, you know, feelings about the problem. I used to say insomnia might be distressing, but it's nothing to lose sleep over. <laughs> and of course, I was just poking more fun at myself than anything else. And corny? Well, yeah, but I'm corny. And anyone who knows me knows that. You know, I'm a very white of the chicken cross the road gal, right? But, um, but insomnia usually comes with high functioning depression or dysthymia because yeah, you're exhausted, you're tired as hell, but the brain doesn't shut off. Your body is crying for rest, but your brain keeps poking it and saying, ha ha, but what about all of our problems? And you keep up all night with your anxiety and your obsessive thoughts about pretty much anything. You know, usually stuff you can't solve because that's the middle of the night. You know, a banking snafu who you have to fix or um, words that you had with your boss earlier in the day that you hope turned out right or the situation with your children and how things are working out, right? Or what kind of um, what kind of um, workload are you sharing with your spouse and whether or not it's equal? You know, things of that nature. And you just stay up and you ruminate. And because you're ruminating, your body just gets tired and tired because your brain just keeps going hee 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 and poking at you so you can't get any sleep. Now, of course, on the opposite side of that is hypersomnia because there are times when our brain will just shut off. If you imagine your brain as a flash drive, Okay, it's a thumb drive with 16 gigabytes of information and you go try to put 17 gigabytes worth of music or, or, or picture files in there, it's not gonna take, okay? And so what happens? Your flash drive ceases to accept new information and your brain can do that too. If there's just too much information going into your brain, that 16 gigabytes you've got in there, once that 17th gigabyte tries to, in, to, to inject itself into your noggin, no go, okay? So your system shuts down and you sleep and you sleep and you sleep and you sleep. Now you don't know this, the little man knows this. The little man in your head, the subconscious that I always like to refer to as the little man, that little man tells you that if you just keep sleeping, none of this is real, okay? And you do this and you have hypersomnia 
and then of course other areas of your life fall to seed because you've been sleeping so much and that gives you more to worry about and that causes more depression and the vicious cycle ensues. And there you go. High functioning depression. All right. <clears throat> now the next one is kind of, well, it's kind of interesting because I, in, I kind of noticed this in myself very much. Um, and it is marked, markedly more irritability. Now, some of us are just irritable. Like that's, I mean, it goes without saying, right? But there are times when with a high functioning depression, a person is just, you know, if you're that tired and if you're just trying to get through the damn day and if you're counting the hours until you could hit the pillow at night, then little things that wouldn't normally annoy um, a psychologically healthy human being will annoy the living bejesus out of you, okay? So like, for example, I noticed that at the end of a day, I've, I've often said that, and I feel so bad for saying this, that if one person, just one more person speaks to me, okay? If I hear the sound of the human voice one more time, I am gonna run screaming in the moonlight, wearing a cape, okay? Wielding a big stick, <laughs> saying, I can't take this anymore. Um, and that is irritability for you. And I'm not even an irritable person. So that shows, that's a marked sign, like I said, of high functioning depression, because your brain is already working overtime trying to make sure that you're safe inside. So it doesn't have any more room for people's BS. You know what I'm talking about? So if one more person comes at you, ah, and you're going to do like that movie scene, you know, open the window, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to take it anymore. happens to you several thousand times a day because you have high functioning depression. All right. Now, the next one is interesting. Um, it is poor decision making skills. Okay. Now, of course, this speaks to the concept of the fact that your brain is hardwired and only has the 16 gigabytes. Okay. If we're going with our original, um, our original metaphor, right? So your brain has all 16 gigabytes filled with information, like I said earlier, right? And so someone comes to you with a decision. Nothing major, not like who to vote for in November. Something as simple as, would you like to purchase a bag for five cents to save the environment? Um, or, um, I'm not sure what to do for dinner. Do you want chicken or meatloaf? Okay. And you can't, it's almost like you need to cry because you're just so frustrated with your own self that you can't make the decision. And it's not earth shattering decision. It's not, it's not choosing a college, you know, it's, it's choosing, it's not, it's not choosing a career path. It's, it's something simple, but you just can't do it because your brain is already filled and you just can't decide anything. And so very often what happens is we wind up deciding nothing because we figure if we decide nothing and if we just clam up and don't say what we need, then we won't be outed for the struggling person we are. And that speaks of course to putting on a happy face and faking being happy. And I have plenty to say about that, of course, but you know, we'll save that. And so poor decision-making skills. Um, yeah, that would be high functioning depression in my book, or at least one of the symptoms, right? Now we're nearing the end of the symptoms, of course. So another one that I'd like to share with you guys, and this is the, actually the final one that I'd like to share with you guys is lack of socialization. Okay, sort of a self-imposed exile. Now, I know in today's society with everything that's going on, we've been told that this is something we have to do to preserve the health of the people on the planet. And so I'm not talking about that. Um, I sort of, I, I dropped a comment in um, the, the comment section of my um, YouTube page yesterday indicating that I'm not going to be speaking more on that topic because I feel as though business as usual is best and that we're all at a time where we need enlightenment, entertainment, and inspiration. Um, not that we didn't need it before, but we're in particularly need of it now that we're home, you know? And so I don't want to drag on and on about that concept. So I'm just going to speak as if it were last year at this time and um, tell you about socialization, assuming we can still do it, right? Because we will, in fact, of course, do it again. But I'm not going to elaborate any further. I'm going to get into the symptom. So, oh, but first I'm going to fix that knot in my hair. Ah. All right, so... Yeah, I like to play with my hair. It's one of those things. That's that's not high functioning depression. That's that's uh, non functioning anxiety. 
but that's a whole other video. So as far as socialization is concerned, um, the thing is that of course it's understandable that a person who is depressed, whether they know that they are or they, or they don't, is going to shy away from social engagements. They're not the people who will say, hell yeah, what time is the dinner party? Oh yeah, what do you want me to bring? Sure, I got the wine, right? Um, this person is sure as hell not going to call up a person and be like, yo, the movie just came out. I'm buying. We're all going to the theater and then we're going out to dinner after. All right, see you at seven. Okay, hell no, because that is another, it's seen, it's almost like an appointment. It's like, you know the things we dread doing? Like, for example, you're at work and everyone's like, oh, have a nice evening. And you're like, not me, I got to go to the dentist. Or, you know, oh, not me, I have to go to the vet. Or whatever it is, appointments that we keep, right? So social engagements start to feel like an appointment. And we're just like, oh, crap, I have to go out to dinner with that guy. And you sort of, this could be your best friend, okay? This could be this could be a date with a person that you're hoping to get to know better. But you find yourself really wishing they'd cancel, okay? Or you find yourself canceling. Or you find yourself not making the date or the appointment to begin with because you know in your, in here, and in here, that you're not going to be able to keep up with it, that you're not going to be able to rise to the social occasion because it took every ounce of courage, strength, and fortitude to wake up this morning, find two socks that match, okay, put on deodorant and walk outside, you know, and so you, you'll be damned if you're going to do anything more, especially if you're irritated at the other people around you to begin with. Why would, why put yourself in such a position, right? So lack of socialization. Now, if you put these things together, right, and you put the tiredness and the bad eating habits and the socialization and the decisions and this and that, if you if you compile the data, right, on yourself, and if you keep a log, if you sort of, I guess if you feel like you recognize yourself in some of these symptoms and you want to maybe jot it down in a diary, you know, or I, I know that sounds like a 12-year-old a girl's word, but if you want to just take a little journal book somewhere and just jot down any of these symptoms, if you find that you're experiencing these, right, then what happens is you wind up with a log. And that log can tell the tale and it can let you know whether or not you're experiencing high functioning depression or dysthymia. Now, of course, we could slap a label on a whole bunch of stuff. You know, um, you know, people in a generation or two beyond me, you know, I'm 43, and so people from my mother's generation and up um, might say, well, everybody's got something, but you just keep on plugging on. You just do what you do. You know, there was no such thing as therapy back in the day, you know, and to a certain extent, they're absolutely right. You know, um, there's a way for us to overdiagnose ourselves because every, you don't, you don't live a certain number of years on the planet without feeling anything and rushing to the diagnosis and breaking out your online DSM-5 and trying to figure out what you've got. You know, I understand that, but you know, just as we do this with WebMD for our physical selves, lots of people do this with their mental health. I understand that. But the thing is that, isn't it wonderful that we live in an age, we live in an age where we can, where instead of maybe if we're a little overdiagnosed, isn't it wonderful that we're not being underdiagnosed? Isn't it wonderful that we're not being told to sit down and shut up that it happened yesterday and get over it? You know, isn't it wonderful that we're being, that we're raising our children in a time where people's feelings are actually valid and that we that we're not supposed to just hush up forget the fact that we're dying inside and go you know stick to it and have fortitude and just you know like live our lives no matter what and then finally collapse in the street when we can't take it anymore or worse become harmful to others when we can't take it anymore and start wielding a weapon around the park or something, you know, like, isn't it marvelous that we live in an age of psychology where we can get help for the things that ail us, you know, it's absolutely fantastic. And I'm so happy that if I had to be born and if I had to be born a woman, I was born in the United States and an adult in the 2000s for this reason. There are so many reasons why I'm unhappy with the time I was born. But again, that's a whole other video. I'm speaking of psychology specifically. So to end this up, and to let you know why I chose this for self-care Sundays, I'd like to say that, you know, it's really easy to brush off the events of the day because of need and because of other people's need and to put on a happy face, you know? Um, I would like to share with you a story that I heard. It's urban legend, I think, but it bears repeating. And that's how I'd like to end the video. Um, the story I'm about to tell is the story of Grimaldi the Clown. Once upon a time, 
<clears throat> there was a man who was incredibly depressed and sought help for his problem. He went to the psychiatrist, told the guy his entire story, and at the end said he was only there as a formality, but he'd already made up his mind to kill himself. The psychiatrist was very upset about this, of course. He prescribed several different medications, told the man to come to therapy three times a week, and also suggested that for entertainment he go see Grimaldi the Clown. The man refused. The doctor pressed the issue and said that Grimaldi the Clown was a wonderful entertainer that was sure to make him smile despite his troubles because he always made everyone smile. Again, the man refused. Finally, the psychiatrist threw up his hands in frustration, stood up at his desk and said, Sir, I'm only trying to help you. I don't understand why you have to be so obstinate. What's so wrong with going to Grimaldi the Clown? The man stood up, looked the psychiatrist in the eye and rendered his answer. He said, Doctor, it's you who don't understand. You see... I am Grimaldi the Clown. I share that story with you because it was told to me about 20 years ago in an effort to help me stop putting on a happy face at all times and admit that I have a problem and seek the psychological help that I need. Okay. Now, of course, we can attest other things to it. You know, this like Pagliacci, the famous opera, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the concept of the sad clown, the concept of Joker, for God's sake, which as I've said in my previous video, there is a huge video coming about Joker and its commentary on mental health. But I'm going to stop there and I'm going to say that if you yourself find yourself in a situation where you have dysthymia, that you meet the criteria of high functioning depression, it runs the risk of becoming a depressive episode or I should say major depressive episode. And isn't it wonderful that we live in a time where we could technically seek help before help becomes crucial? when we want to, rather than when it's become absolutely necessary, right? So in an effort for us all not to be Grimaldi the Clown, I suggest that we all take a moment, think about the situation, consider the symptoms that I've listed, and put yourself on a list, a person who is experiencing these things or a person who's not. Take a look at loved ones around you and determine whether or not they share some of these symptoms as well. And then, of course, sit down and figure out your best course of action should you find that you are involved in this situation. I did that myself. I did that myself a good 20 years ago, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you I'm perfect, but I'm a hell of a lot better than I used to be. And that's because I wasn't ashamed to quit being Grimaldi the Clown all the time and ask for assistance with my high-functioning depression, with other things that kept me from functioning at all, and the ability to sit here and tell you guys all this information and give you this channel for inspiration when you need it. So with that, I'm going to say continue to stay safe. And if at any time during this social isolation or social distancing, I should say, that you need anything from me, you just let me know. I will continue to provide you content that is uplifting, entertaining, and to the best of my abilities, three times a week. And I'm also an English teacher. so. You don't hesitate to comment if you need my help. You have my social medias on my channel, and I'm here to serve because that's what we do in a time of crisis. We help each other. We help each other not just through our high-functioning depression, but through all the things that ails us. That's what I like to think we do anyway. That's how I handle it. So I leave it up to you. Have a wonderful evening. Have a great rest of the week. And I'll see you on Top 10 Tuesdays. Bye.